Church, how are we doing this morning? Good to see you today. Happy 2015. Feels good, doesn't it? The beginning of a new year. And uh, I want to kick off the new year talking about the power of hope. You know, every person needs hope, but we live in a world that seems to be hopeless, don't we? It's hard to have hope. We see the rise of ISIS. Uh, we see Ebola. We see racial divisions uh, caused by the Ferguson and the uh, New York, uh, Long Island incidents. Uh, we see cyber attacks. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons to be hopeless. When we look at the world around us, we see turmoil, we see chaos, and sometimes we look at our own lives and we see turmoil and chaos, don't we? We get a negative report from the doctor or we look at our uh, employment status or we look at some of our family situations and there's so many reasons to be hopeless but this morning I want to challenge you to dare to hope the prophet Jeremiah penned these words dare to hope in the book of Lamentations chapter 3 and I want to turn our attention to the scripture this morning as we talk about a brand new year and how we too can dare to hope now, this passage in the book of Lamentations is an interesting one. It's, it's found in Lamentations chapter 3. And, and, and I would guess many of you have really not heard sermons before from the book of Lamentations. If you have read the book of Lamentations, you might want to pluck all of your eyebrows out, okay? It, there's some tough parts of the book of Lamentations. It can be kind of rough, okay? But God has some great things to say to us in this book. But let me just kind of set the stage for us a little bit. If you look at the book of Lamentations, it reads like an ancient journal. And this, uh, the occurrences surrounding this book are kind of like the, 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 the 9-11 uh, of Judah. Except actually worse. Uh, Jerusalem has been sieged for 30 months. Nebuchadnezzar II from Babylon has come in and he's surrounded the city. People are starving to death. Finally, after 30 months, they penetrate the wall. And uh, people are killed, people lose their lives, women are raped, uh, kids are starving to death, people are murdered. It is a nasty scene. The Babylonians come in and they destroy the Temple of Solomon, which was the Jewish place of worship. And man, if you were a, a Jewish person living there in Jerusalem, you felt like you had pretty much lost it all. And, and it's with that background that the prophet begins to, to pin these words today of hope. You know, hope is such a powerful thing, and, and Viktor Frankl was the Jewish psychiatrist who was stuck in the Nazi concentration camp of Auschwitz, and he was fascinated by pe how people responded to the rigors of adversity in that concentration camp. Uh, many people uh, were determined to not be conquered by the Nazis, even though they were incarcerated, and yet other people just lost their mind. Went, went totally insane living under those, those very difficult circumstances. And so as a psychiatrist, he wanted to study why did some people respond this way and why did others respond this way. And he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And in this book, this is what he said about the power of hope. The prisoner who lost faith in the future became doomed. With his loss of belief in the future, he also lost his spiritual hold. He let himself decline and become subject to mental and spiritual decay. You see, the, the, the most powerful force in the world is, 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 is the power of hope. We've got to have the power of hope. The power of hope is the thing that sustains us in the midst of adversity. It's the thing that, that, that motivates us and encourages us and keeps us going when we look around and things don't look so hot. Well, this was Jeremiah's life, and if you look in Lamentations 3.1, the Bible says, I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. And so things are bad. You know, Jeremiah's like, man, things are real bad. And there is a point where things get so bad that all the only way you can go is up, right? I mean, and that's where Jeremiah is at this point. He's like, man, I have seen it all. This is devastating. This is terrible what has happened. But there is only one way up. And he continues on this line of thought in Lamentations 3, 19 and 20. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. And there's a danger in suffering. And there's a danger. Suffering and hardship can be the greatest thing for your faith. Or it can be the most toxic thing as well. 
And uh, many people go through hardships and they become bitter and, and, and cynical and negative. Somebody's marriage ends, ends and they think, you know what, I can't stand all women. Or, you know, I'm a man hater, you know, because I went through that experience. Other people go through hardship and they come out on the other end like clay in the hands of a holy God. Moldable, pliable, open. This is Jeremiah. So suffering can either make our faith or sometimes it can even break our faith but you know what God wants to take the hardships in our life and he wants to teach us and he wants to transform us he wants to change us that's why we need the power of hope the power of hope and Jeremiah begins to focus his attention in the midst of overwhelming adversity on four principles today I want to give you four resolutions four thoughts today four revelations from the scripture today that will give you hope for this coming year. Check this out. Number one, the Lord is love. The Lord is love. You are never alone. Look at this in verse 22. Yet I still dare to hope. I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. It never ends. And so Jeremiah says, you know what? I can dare to hope. I can dare to hope because of God's amazing love. Another translation says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. And so God's love is a covenant love. In fact, this word love means relationship, like a covenant. You know, the moment that you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you enter into a covenant with God. You enter into a relationship with God. You were God's creation, but now you are God's daughter. Now you are God's son. You are part of God's family. And, and we have a covenant with God. And God says this love that he has for us is one that is driven by relationship. And, and it's interesting, you know, family love is something that's so different from, from, from other types of love. Uh, you know that there's people that you spend time with at Thanksgiving and at Christmas. And, and, and maybe you ask yourself this question, now, why do I spend time with them, you know? And then you remind yourself, oh, because they're family, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I would never be friends with somebody like that, but they're family, right? You got that crazy uncle or that aunt or that, that sibling or those in-laws, you know, and you're constantly thinking, well, man, I, you know, I got nothing in common with them. How could they even be a part of this family? But you love them anyway. You love them because they're family. You love them because they're family. You know, love is kind of funny because you can think things about your family and, and, and you might say some things about your family, but if somebody in another family says that about your family, then that's upsetting and frustrating, right? Even though you know it may be true, right? Because that's your family. And so I can say that about my family, but you cannot. <laughs> There's a covenant of love, the scripture says. Jeremiah finds hope in discovering that God is love. God is love. God loves you. God loves you, and we should not confuse bad with the end. You know, sometimes we forget about God's love, and we do what verse 22 says in the NIV. It says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. When you begin to look at, at a hopeless situation, sometimes things look worse than they really are. And sometimes we go through, through seasons where there's a distortion of what reality is. You know, you get discouraged and things aren't going well. And you think that the sky is falling and that this is the, this is the worst it could possibly be. But the truth is, it could probably be worse than that. There's a distortion that's there. And the Bible says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not, we are not consumed. Now, here's another thing about God's love. God's love is loyal. God's love is loyal. It's not fickle. It's not moody. It, 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 it's, it's not conditional. You know, a lot of human love is conditional. I will love you as long as you do this. Or, 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 or I will love you as long as you fill in the blank. You know, and you, you, you abide by these things. God's love transcends all of that. God's love, it, it even supersedes our, our own actions. And it's a covenant love. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relational love that God has for us. That's why it says the everlasting love or the steadfast love. It's because God is steadfast. He's loyal. He keeps loving us even when we don't deserve it, even when we make mistakes. And that's why we ought to say every day, I am loved by God. Because when you, when you realize that you are loved by God, you know what it will do? It will begin to eradicate feelings of loneliness. The Lord is love. You are never alone. 
The problem is when you don't feel loved, you feel alone. When you know somebody loves you, it brings significance into your life and it helps you rise above your circumstances. That's why it's so important for parents to love children. That's why it's so important for spouses to show love to one another. That's why we need to to love others as God has first loved us. Because love, love teaches us that we are never alone. We're never alone. And so every day we have to remind ourselves, I am loved by God. You know, you may look at the world and you may say, man, I don't know if anybody else on the planet loves me. Know this, God loves you. God loves you. And this began to reorient the prophet's attention away from just all of the pain and misery and suffering. He began to say, you know what? I still dare to hope because the Lord's love never, never ends. So the Lord is love and we're never alone. But look at the second thing. The Lord is also faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. You're not forgotten. Okay, great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning, and God's resources will match your need for that day. They're new every morning. Uh, Look at that again. His mercies begin afresh every morning. God knows what you need every day. You know that? God knows what you need even better than you do. Before you know what you need, God knows what you need. And that's why we should give our mornings to God. I want to challenge every person that's here today to spend some time in the morning reading some scripture and praying, even if it's just for a few minutes, because you know what? You're reminded of the mercies of God when you begin to do so. And you may be thinking, you know what, Ryan? That sounds cool, but I'm not a morning person. You know what? Here's the truth. When you get excited about what God is doing in your life, you will become a morning person because you won't be able to wait to get out of bed to see what God is going to say to you that day. His mercies are new every day, and God knows what you need today, and God knows the mercies you need tomorrow, and God knows the mercies you need next week. That's why we should seek him with all of our hearts. He is faithful. He is faithful. We are not forgotten. It's kind of like uh, in the book of Exodus The uh, children of Israel are wandering in the wilderness. Remember, they're trying to get to the promised land. They've just left Egyptian captivity for several hundred years. And how did God provide for the Israelites? How did they have food? They were in a desert. They had manna. And each day, this this food-like substance would be on the ground, and the people would gather it up, and they would eat. And God would provide what the people needed that day. Now, what would would happen when, when the people tried to store some manna? If people tried to keep some for like a, a midnight snack or maybe some for tomorrow, it would spoil, wouldn't it? And manna is that word in Hebrew that means what is it? So I'm not sure that manna looked that great. People were like, what is it? I said that at the cafeteria as a kid, you know, what is it? You know, <laughs> what is it? But it was God's provision for that day. His mercies are new every morning. God has provision for you each day. Each day, God is faithful. God is faithful. And listen, God is even faithful when we are faithless. There are 7,487 promises in the Bible. And if that doesn't get you motivated today at church, I don't know what will. God's mercies never end. He is faithful. You can always count on God. Now, how can we count on God? Let me give you a couple of examples here about the faithfulness of God. God's faithful when we're tempted. Do you know that? God's faithful when we're tempted. 1 Corinthians 10 says that he'll make the way of escape for us. But look at 2 Thessalonians 3.3. It says, but the Lord is what? Say it with me. He's faithful, right? The Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. So when you are tempted, sometimes we pray, God, let that temptation go away. A lot of times God strengthens us during temptation. So you may look at that, that, that point of temptation and you may be thinking, man, I got to have that. I look so good. I got to take it, you know. God will strengthen you when you are tempted because God is faithful. Like God is faithful. He's also faithful during times of discouragement. God's faithful then. You may not be feeling it, so to speak. God's faithful. God's faithful. Do you remember in the book of of, of 1 Samuel, David is about to go on the field of battle with Goliath. 
And nobody thinks that David can defeat Goliath. I mean, everybody is making fun of him. He's too small. You're too inexperienced. You're too young. You don't have the credentials. You don't even have any armor. You don't have any fighting experience. What's wrong with you? Saul doesn't believe in David. His brothers don't believe in him. The army of Israel doesn't believe in him. Everybody is completely intimidated by this monster of a man named Goliath. And how does David find hope? You know what he does? He remembers what God had done in the past. Look at this with me in, in chapter 17, verse 37. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistines. He's like, you know what? God was faithful yesterday and God's going to be faithful today. I defeated the bear and the lion. I can now defeat the monkey. God is faithful. God is faithful. And he's even faithful when we make a mess of our lives. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. And if you've made a mess of your life as we begin a new year, this would be a great time to confess those sins to God. Because what happens when we come clean, when we agree with God, when we say the same about our sin as God does, our, our relationship with him is restored. We have fellowship with God. We have fellowship with God. Now, our relationship with God is always intact the moment that we commit our lives to Jesus Christ. But you know what? The fellowship with God can be broken. You know, I can have a disagreement with my wife, and we're still married, but we can be out of fellowship. And so fellowship is restored by confession. So if there's some sin in your life you need to get right with God, confess that to God, and here's what happens. God is faithful. The Bible says you get a clean slate. You get a clean slate. It's kind of like those Etch-a-Sketch. Anybody play Etch-a-Sketch as a kid? I love those things. You had one dial that was the vertical and you had another dial that was the horizontal and you could draw all kinds of creations. But here was the best part. If you messed up, what could you do? You could shake it off, right? That's what Taylor Swift said, right? You could just shake it off. You can shake it and what happens? It's all new, all fresh again. I tell you, I love things that are fresh and new. Does anything smell better than a brand new car? I feel great. How about a brand new computer? You know, that's always fun to have. How about a, a, a brand new outfit, right? Okay, ladies in the house, you like that? Come to church, a little extra, you know, a little extra smile on your face. Yeah, new feels good. New feels good. God's mercies are new every day. They never get old. God is always fresh. God's always exciting. Here's the thing. You never know what God's going to do in your life. And that's why he's God. And that's why it's so fun to serve him. Because you get on this journey of faith with Jesus Christ and you're walking along and you're just like, God's going to take you in some places that you, you didn't even think were possible. How did I get here? I've just been walking with God. His mercies are new every morning. God is faithful. God is faithful. You're not alone. He's faithful. And God's even faithful when we doubt our salvation. Sometimes we feel like we got to be good enough to live up to the standard. And you know what? Here's, here's the reality. Here's the reality. We already failed that in the first place. You could never be good enough to earn God's love. God loves you because of his grace and his mercy. And God is faithful when we doubt. Look at 1 John 5, 13. These things I've written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. Not hope or, or have a shot at, but that you may know that you can be confident in. God wants you to be confident in your relationship with him. And in just a few minutes, I want to give you an opportunity to commit your life to Jesus Christ as we begin this new year. Because it is the greatest decision that we will ever make. So the Lord is love. You're not alone. The Lord is faithful, you're not forgotten. And the Lord is my portion, you're taken care of. Now look at this in verse 24. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait on him. And another translation says, depend on him. But a portion is an amount of food served for one person. If you came over to my house and we were having dinner and I got a plate and I put some mashed potatoes and some some squash and some pork chops, you know, and some broccoli, and I gave it to you, that would be your portion, right? That would be like a normal portion. When you go to a restaurant and they bring you a plate of food, there's a portion that's there. And a portion is an, a, a food allotment for you. 
And it kind of reminds me of an experience I had at a fast food restaurant here right next to the church that I won't say the name of. But I was over there and I'd ordered some food and I wanted some water. And so I walked up to the counter and I said to the lady, I said, can I please have a water cup? And so she said, oh, sir, absolutely. She reached under the cabinet. You know what she pulled out? She pulled out a Dixie cup. It was this big. I was like, this is like one step up from a communion cup. <laughs> and I looked at the cup, and I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. I was shocked, you know, because I, I mean, I know they like to make those water cups small, but like this was really small. I looked at the cup, and I just didn't say anything. I just paused. I looked at the cup like this, and then I looked up at her, and she said, oh, sir. She said, would you like another cup? <laughs> I was like, you think? You know, I didn't. <laughs> And so I thought, oh, man, this lady's on, on her game. They need to make her the manager of this place. Like, she's got great customer service. And I thought, I was good for at least a medium, you know. I thought, and if I smile really nice and act really good, maybe a large. And if the manager's not looking, maybe an extra large. You know, that's kind of what I'm thinking. She reaches down under the cabinet. You know what she pulls out? She pulls out another cup and sets it down. It's another Dixie cup. <laughs> now i got two Dixie cups. I just looked at her and I said, you know what, I think I'm good. You know, I just turned around and walked off. The portion wasn't right. The portion wasn't right. Gina was over at Chipotle the other day and she, um, she had ordered a meal and she asked for some guacamole. And so they, the lady took a big spoonful and just dabbed it on there. We love that, you know. It's awesome. Well, she went back a few days later and she asked for guacamole and the lady said, oh, that'll be $1.87 extra. Gina said, that'll be fine. And she takes the, the, the spoon and she just gets a little dab of it. I mean, it's like that big, like a smidgen of of what, And she puts it on there. And Gina's like, well, hey, wait a second. I'm paying $1.87, you know. I mean, can I have some guacamole? And she said, uh, well, you know, I put some on there. And she said, well, you know, I was here a few days ago and they put a whole gob of it on there. And now you just put a little smidgen of guacamole. What's going on? She said, the management is really cracking down around here on the guacamole. <laughs> Tough people. I've seen some of those managers standing in the back looking over, you know. Hey, come here, sir. You gave too much point. You know, gave too much meat. You know, that kind of thing. Whispering and stuff like that. You better stop this. I was eating at uh, Garbanzo's and I asked for some lettuce on my little plate. And... Uh, you know, I have a lot of food allergies, so there's a lot of food I cannot eat. So when I go through a place like that, I'm always frustrated because, you know, I can't have dairy and I can't have cheese and I can't have gluten and things like that. So, like, my menu gets very narrow very quickly. So I'm always wanting, like, a little extra of, of a few things to compensate for a little bit of a lot of things. But the people are not programmed that way, right? I mean, they're just going to put a little bit on wherever you go. And so my, I, I got to the end of the line and... And I, it, I had these big, this big hole in my plate. You know, it just didn't look right. And I was like, I need to get my money's worth. So I said to the lady, I said, can I have just a little bit more lettuce? And, and the lady went over and she took two strands of lettuce and put it on there. And she looked at me like, there are going to be kids starving in Vietnam because you have eaten all of the lettuce. <laughs> There's a portion problem. You know what? The Bible says God is our portion. God is our portion. He's our portion, and God never skimps on the portions. God knows exactly what you need. God knows exactly what you need. See, you go to CC's, they're skimping on the portions. You know what CC's does? They have the all-you-can-eat buffet. They just keep cutting, they keep raising the prices, but they keep cutting smaller pieces of pizza. And they keep giving you smaller plates. See, a lot of you didn't realize that. So you got to go through the line like four times to get like one helping. But then psychologically, you feel like you're going to be fat because you went through the line so many times. But the truth was you went through the line so many times just because the plate was so small and the portions were so little. God is our portion. He knows exactly what, our, what we need. He does not skimp on the portions. And listen, God's portions always satisfy so let's look at this statement again. The Lord is my portion. First of all, the Lord, okay, the Lord is my portion. The Lord 
is what satisfies. What we crave in our life is the Lord. Sometimes we think that our portion is stuff. Sometimes we think that our portion is possessions or achievements. The Bible says the Lord, the Lord is my portion. That's what satisfies. You notice the second part of this. It says the Lord is, the Lord is my portion. It's present tense. God is my portion today. His mercies are new every day. God knows what you need today. God knows what you need tomorrow. The Lord is my portion. And then look at the last part of that phrase. The Lord is my portion. My portion. My portion. God knows exactly how much we need. He knows how much. Now at the Heller household when we have dinner, we have kid portion, we have mama portion, and we have daddy portion. There's like little bits, a little bit more, and then there's the big portion. Daddy gets the big portion, right? Kids get little portions. It would be disproportioned to have the kid portion on daddy's plate and vice versa, right? I mean, if my kids had my plate, they just wouldn't, they just wouldn't eat it. Well, they would be wasted. If I had their portion, I'd be starving to death. God knows the portion. God knows what you need. God knows what you need. And listen, when we get in tune with God, God begins to satisfy. God begins to satisfy the hungers of our lives. So the Lord is my portion. That's why we can count on him. But look at this final part, this final statement today in, in verse 25. Because the Bible says the Lord is good and that we should seek him. The Lord is good, so we should seek him. The Lord is good, we should seek him. The Lord is good to those who what on him? Wait on him. And to those who search for him. And if you want to find the goodness of God, here's the question. Are you searching for God? Are you searching for God? A lot of people say, I want to see the goodness of God. But they don't do anything. The Bible says, if you want to find God's goodness, search for him. And it's interesting, this word depend uh, or wait, depending on the translation, it can be the same word. It can be, it's actually translated differently in different translations, but it's the same concept, wait and depend. One translation says, uh, those who wait on him. Another says, those who depend on him. But listen, when you wait on God, you're depending on him. And when you're depending on God, you're waiting on him. Works together. So are you waiting on God? And then are you searching for him? The Lord is good. Now that word wait and depend also means eager, eager expectation. So when I'm waiting on God, that doesn't mean I'm just like laying around, you know, watching some TV and some chips. I'm like waiting on God. I am looking. I am praying. I am believing. I'm expecting. That's what it means to, to depend on God, to wait on God. There's expectation. I'm expecting God to do something in my life in this year. I'm expecting God to do something in my family. I'm expecting God to do something in my career. I'm seeking after God. God is good, and I'm expecting him to do something amazing. So I'm not just waiting. I'm waiting expectantly. And waiting expectantly means I'm expecting God to answer, but I'm also giving him the flexibility to work in his own way. Isn't that great? When we wait on God, we will find hope. And when we have hope, we will discover that the Lord is good. So man, this morning, as we begin a new year, I dare you to hope. I dare you to pray. I dare you to believe. I dare you to wait on God and to expect great things from Him. Because it's hard to have hope. But you know what, when we begin to meditate on these four things, we dare to hope.